All right, hi again. This is a re-recording of lecture seven uh, from my series of lectures on universal algebra and lattice theory. I uh, did in fact fail to stick to the schedule that I had originally set out for myself. Um, I will just continue to give these talks as I find time to. I hope to finish the entire series that I had planned um, sometime during the next year, which is 2021, um, or at least hopefully before I finish grad school in 2022. So today I will be talking about complete lattices. And as always, I have to drag my annotation stuff over to the other screen and make sure my pen is working. Okay, so we are in business. First, I'm going to give the motivation uh, for uh, complete lattices and then their formal definition. Uh, then I'll give some examples of complete lattices, after which I'll talk about subuniverse and congruence lattices, which will turn out to be themselves examples of complete lattices. Then I'll go on to discuss complete sublattices, and finally the congruence lattices of groups and of lattices, which will turn out to be pretty special. So let's fix a lattice L, which has as elements subsets of the natural numbers and as uh, meet and join the intersection union. So these are subsets of the natural numbers under their usual ordering by containment. So if I have any collection of subsets of the natural numbers, say script X, then, oh, then we have that the union of script X is um, actually itself a subset of the natural numbers. And so for some reason, my annotation stuff is escaping from me. And so let me see if I can get it to come back. That's really weird. Okay. All right, here we go. So, okay. So for example, we can take our script X to be this collection, which has the singleton one, the singleton three, the singleton five, and all singleton sets for all odd numbers, and then say also the set 2, 3, 5, and the set uh, 4, 16. This is a perfectly good collection of subsets of the natural numbers. And if we take uh, the union of all of the elements of x, then we're going to get the set containing 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on with all of the odd numbers union with the set containing these finitely many even numbers that we're also adding in, which are 2, 4, and 16. And this is itself a subset of the natural numbers. So if I take this arbitrary union of my collection of subsets x, I do get another subset of the natural numbers. And so it actually turns out that this union is the supremum or least upper bound of the collection X in my lattice L. And so we think of this union as the infinite join of the members of X. We haven't really talked about operations that take infinitely many different arguments, uh, but this can be thought of as something like the join, which is a binary operation, except now we're taking the join of infinitely many things at once. Okay, so this isn't something that happens in every possible lattice. If we take the lattice L whose elements are only finite subsets of the natural numbers, then, uh, then we can consider this collection X whose members are the sections of the naturals where the section N is the set containing one, two, three, up through N. So X more explicitly if I can draw this script X, which is challenging for me to write, then this is a set containing one, the set containing, <laughs> the set containing one, the set containing one and two, the set containing one and two and three, 
and so on and so forth. So this collection X has no upper bound in L, much less the least upper bound. You might guess that an upper bound would be the collection of all natural numbers. However, the collection of all natural numbers is not a finite subset of the natural numbers. And so it doesn't belong to our lattice L and it can't be an upper bound for X in L. So since the collection X has no upper bound in L, it certainly can't have a least upper bound. And thus the supremum of X does not exist in L. So we can't just for any lattice extend the join operation to take infinitely many different elements um, as arguments because that infinite join or that supremum won't exist in an arbitrary lattice L. So we have language for this. We say that a lattice L is complete when given any subset X of L, we have that both the supremum of X and the infimum of X exist in the lattice L. So we're going to define this uh, big V, big join of X to be the supremum of X and this big wedge or big or meat of X to be the infimum of X. So when we have an indexed collection of elements, say little xi indexed over a set i, then we're going to define the join indexed over the set i to be that su same supremum and similarly for the infinite meet. And so this is consistent with the notation that we had before where we wrote uh, something like the union of all sets x in our collection script x. And that was actually the same thing as the supremum of our collections uh, script x when we were looking at uh, the collection of subsets of the natural numbers. And so this, uh, this notation is similar for good reason. Okay, so now for a whole bunch of examples, uh, the lattice uh, whose elements are subsets of the naturals under their usual ordering by containment is complete. If you take uh, the intersection of any collection of natural, any collection of collections of natural numbers, you'll get uh, you'll get another collection of natural numbers, and similarly for a union. So the uh, lattice whose elements are finite subsets of the natural numbers under their usual ordering is not complete. And so we saw an example before where the supremum of the set of all uh, sections of the natural numbers. Uh, the supremum of this collection uh, does not exist in, in this instance, although it does in, in the original lattice whose elements are all subsets of the natural numbers. But if we're only looking at finite subsets, those do form a lattice themselves, but it's not complete. So if we stick on uh, one more element, which is all of the natural numbers, then this lattice will be complete. So we, uh, so we do actually have that this lattice is complete. And so, um, and so uh, in this lattice, we had that the uh, supremum of, um, well, I guess I don't need to write it again. So in this lattice, we had that this supremum exists. And in this lattice, we also have that the supremum now exists and is again, the natural numbers. Um, however, uh, you should be careful um, because in this lattice, if I compute the uh, supremum of say the set containing, um, uh, say the set containing, um, the sections of the natural numbers for n strictly greater than one. Nope, that's not what I want. All right. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna back off from that. <laughs> I just randomly decided I wanted to do this example, but I need to just chill out. I've had too much coffee already today. Okay. So the point is that the point is that we'll see that even though this this guy is also complete joins 
infinite joins in this do not have to be infinite joins in this. They're, they're going to be different. So to go on to another example, the uh, lattice whose elements are the natural numbers under the usual ordering is not complete. And so I'm going to draw a picture of this on the side here. So if we look at this Hasse diagram, which has one, two, three, four, and so forth and so on forever, then if I consider the uh, collection um, X whose elements are um, whose elements are uh, well, actually I can I can uh, yeah okay I'll do I'll do this so the collection uh, X whose elements are two n uh, for natural numbers n, or in other words, the collection of all even numbers, and I have two, four, uh, six, and so forth, and that collection has no um, upper bound in this lattice, and as such has no least upper bound. So that's sort of the same problem that we've seen a bunch of times already. Uh, however, if I stick on one additional, uh, one additional element, which I call infinity, and say is bigger than everybody else, then uh, that resulting lattice will actually be complete. And in that case, we'll find that the supremum of X actually just becomes infinity. Note that if I look at the real numbers um, as a lattice under their usual ordering, it's kind of hard to draw the Hasse diagram uh, because there are uncountably many and they're not, uh, they're not well ordered. But uh, if I draw this sort of schematic for the Hasse diagram, negative one, zero, one, and so forth, then uh, this lattice um, is not complete. Basically, um, for the same reason, if I take this collection X that consists, say, of all even numbers, two, four, and so forth, then that collection won't have an upper bound in the real line, um, much less, less a least upper bound. This is contrary to the language that's used in analysis and topology, where we only want that least upper bound property for uh, collections of elements which are bounded above. And so uh, the condition in lattice theory for being complete is actually, is actually stronger in that we want, um, in order for a lattice to be complete, we want that all collections of elements have uh, a least upper bound. So it is possible to, um, to make this lattice uh, complete by adding two new elements now, which are infinity, as in the case of the natural numbers, but also negative infinity, which is an element which is less than every other uh, real number and also less than infinity. And so this resulting lattice will be complete and the supremum of that collection X well, again, be infinity in this uh, sort of completed lattice of real numbers. Okay. So now at long last, we are ready to uh, make lattices out of the subuniverses and congruences of algebras. And so in order to do this, we'll actually use the following result. If we have a post at P, in which the infimum of X exists for any subset X of P, then P is a complete lattice. So if we want to check whether some post set is a complete lattice, it's actually enough to check that it has arbitrary infima. All right, so in order to prove this, uh, well, we already have the P as arbitrary infima, so it remains to show that P has arbitrary suprema. If we take some X, which is a subset of P, then we need to show that the supermoment of X actually exists within the post at P. So we're going to take a collection Y, which consists of all of the upper bounds for X. So, uh, so Y is just every element of our post set, which is an upper bound for X. So say this is X and then uh, and then y is going to consist of all of the things in our post set, which 
lie above every single thing that's in X. Okay. So now um, one idea for finding the supremum of X, if it, if it does indeed exist, is that we should take the infimum or the greatest lower bound for Y. Now, the problem with this is that we don't know that that infimum is itself, is itself an upper bound for X. But it seems like a good guess that, that this little A, which is the infimum of Y, could be, um, could be the least upper bound for X because it would be below all of the upper bounds for Y. Um, but it seems like it also has a shot at being bigger than everything in X. It turns out that that is the case because if we have any little X in our set X, then X is less than or equal to Y for any little Y in Y because Y consists of all of the little Y's which are bigger than any little X for any little X in X. So X is always a lower bound. Any little X in X is always a lower bound for the set Y. Since A is uh, the greatest, um, yeah, since, since, um, since A is the greatest among the lower bounds of Y, then that means that um, X must be less than or equal to A for any X and X because because I, A is A has to be greater than or equal to any lower bound for Y. So X is a lower bound for Y, so X must be less than or equal to A. Since this is true for all X, it follows that A is actually an upper bound for X. So A is actually an upper bound for X. And so that means that A belongs to the set Y. And so so A is actually the least of all upper bounds for X. Okay, so a post set having, um, having arbitrary infima is actually enough to see that uh, that post set is a complete lattice. Well, we have a corollary of this, which tells us that the subuniverses and congruences of any algebra form complete lattices. So given an algebra A, we actually have that the subuniverses and the congruences are complete lattices, form complete lattices under their usual ordering by containment. So we already know that the subuniverses um, and congruences of an algebra are closed under taking arbitrary intersections, which give our arbitrary infima. And so then we're basically done by the previous result. There's one point that I swept under the rug in a previous talk, which was that we technically need to be able to compute the intersection of an empty collection of subsets. And so uh, this is actually a little bit of a subtle point because if I take the intersection of an empty collection of subsets by this sort of usual definition that would be the collection of all X such that given any uh, given any, say, S, which is uh, an element of the collection of subsets that I'm looking at, then I want that, um, yeah, so the, the arbitrary intersection of a collection of subsets is the collection of all X so that if I take any set in my collection, X has to be in that set. So it's in each of the sets in the collection. However, the condition that S is in the empty set uh, never occurs because the empty set has no elements. So this is vacuously true. And this looks like it should be the set containing all possible X. And so by naive set theory, this is, this is an impossible um, object to have. And it's certainly not what we want. Okay. so. What's the proper way to compute the intersection of an empty collection of subsets? Well, if we're gonna be really careful, then we should always specify that our collection of, of our collection of sub or our collection of elements is actually um, a subset of um, is actually a subset of uh, the collection of subsets of some set A. <laughs> um, and so 
uh, in that case, we can define the intersection of this collection X to be the set of all little a in our set A, which we can think of as a universal set in the sense of set theory, or um, it will actually be the universe of our algebra A in the case that we're looking at the subuniverse lattice. It'll actually be A squared if we're looking at the congruence lattice, but pretty similar. So we're just going to look at all little a in our universal set A, which satisfy this property that they belong to every single uh, every single collection um, X in our collection of subsets script X. And so if we follow this definition, where we now have that we're only looking at the little a's in our universal set A, we do actually get that the intersection of an empty collection of subsets in the context that we're considering is A itself, or again, A squared in the collection, in this, in the context of the con lattice of congruences of an algebra. And so this uh, nitpicky bit of set theory resolves the corner case where we have to show that these collections are closed under taking intersections of zero many, uh, zero many subsets. Okay. So uh, recall that Orr had a program during the 1930s that I mentioned before, where lattices became the central object of study in all of mathematics. One of the shortcomings of this approach is that it was not clear how to extract all properties of an object from a corresponding lattice. So although we can uh, in general learn lots of things about an algebra or some other mathematical object by studying uh, various lattices associated with it, there's not always an obvious way to extract the property that we want by looking at, uh, at some corresponding lattice, because it's not always clear even which lattice to look at. And so, for example, if we consider the cyclic groups of order two and three, respectively, C2 and C3, then we actually have that the uh, lattices of subuniverses and congruences of each of these guys are all isomorphic and they're all isomorphic to the lattice with just two with just two elements, which are say zero and one, the bottom and top element. And so uh, this will correspond to the trivial subgroup of C2 or C3 and this will correspond to all of C2 or C3. And remember that the congruence lattice of, uh, of a group is actually just isomorphic to the lattice of normal uh, subgroups of that group. And so the comment that I just made about zero being the trivial subgroup and one being the whole subgroup actually gives you the description for the congruence lattice too, uh, because all subgroups of an abelian group are normal. Okay, so um, just on this information alone, we can't distinguish between these two, um, these two pretty, uh, pretty uh, simple uh, finite groups here. So, um, okay, so lattice theory is actually very useful and interesting. And even the congruence and subalgebra lattices of algebras are, in general, quite interesting and informative. However, um, just these two guys alone can't distinguish um, even these two finite groups here. So, in the 1920s, uh, which was actually before Orr's program, Ada Rotlander had studied the problem of distinguishing groups by their subgroup lattices using only those isomorphisms which respect conjugation in a certain sense. Um, so this situation actually uh, doesn't respect conjugation in Rotlander's definition. She found that even under the stricter condition, uh, there were still non-isomorphic pairs of groups with isomorphic subgroup lattices, even in the stronger sense. And so, uh, and so unfortunately, even that additional condition already um, was not, there. that still was not enough. Well, in any case, uh, let's move on to complete sublattices. We have another corollary from our earlier proposition. If we take some set A, then we have that the lattice of all equivalence relations on A is actually a complete lattice. And so the reason for this is essentially that um, the lattice of all equivalence 
relations on a set A is actually the congruence lattice of an algebra A, where that algebra A is the algebra whose universe is A and which has an empty collection of basic operations. So we can always view any set as an algebra in this sort of trivial way. And if you look at what the definition of the congruence means for such an algebra, you'll find that it is precisely an equivalence relation on the universe A with no other constraints. So by our previous result, we have that the equivalence relations of A uh, form a complete lattice. We actually know that the equivalence, um, okay, so now we know that the equivalence uh, relation lattice on a set A supports taking arbitrary joins, but how do we actually compute them? Um, we already know how to do arbitrary meets because the meet of a collection of congruence or of a collection of equivalence relations is just the, the intersection of all of those equivalence relations um, for any collection of equivalence relations on A. Um, okay, but how do we, how do we, um, okay, but how do we compute joins? We know uh, that by our previous argument, we know that we can take, uh, we can take the join of this uh, collection big theta to be the, um, the infimum of the collection um, of all say, uh, say psi um, equivalence relation psi on A uh, so that uh, psi is an upper bound for theta that was by the previous, uh, the previous argument that we gave, but um, it's not really, it's not really very clear how to actually directly compute this because uh, it requires us to form the collection of all upper bounds and then find its infimum, um, which is not, not very constructive or not very direct. What we'd like is a way of building up uh, this join in some sort of systematic uh, computable way. So this proposition will help us to do that. If we have a set A and some collection of equivalence relations on A, then uh, we actually have that the join of that collection in the equivalence relation lattice is going to be this trivial equivalence relation, which remember is the set of all pairs AA, so that, oops, so that little A is in the set A. So we take that diagonal or trivial equivalence relation and then union it with the, uh, this um, big union of all of the relative products of theta one with theta two up through theta K for any natural number K and, um, and uh, where all of these theta I belong to I collection theta. So we can just take that diagonal and then and then uh, union in all of the equivalence relations that we get by taking the relative product of, or all of the relations that we get by taking the relative product of um, the theta i for any finite collection of theta i in uh, our set of equivalence relations theta. And so um, we're just gonna sketch the proof of this. If we call the left-hand side alpha and the right-hand side beta, then uh, we can actually see that beta is an equivalence relation in a way similar to how uh, we gave an explicit construction for the congruence generated by um, a set of pairs in an algebra A previously. Um, and, so, uh, and so since beta is then an equivalence relation on A and it contains each of the um, theta I or each of the little thetas in big theta, then this is an equivalence relation that must um, lie above the equivalence relation um, big theta. And so the least upper bound, or <laughs> that must lie above all of the equivalence relations in big theta. So the least upper bound of all of those equivalence relations must lie, um, must lie below 
uh, some other upper bound. Okay. So, uh, so the picture we have is like this. We have a bunch of little thetas, theta one, theta two. They can even be uncountably many, but we have a whole bunch of them. They all, they all lie. Uh, they all lie below the join of the collection, big theta. And then uh, we now see that there's this uh, beta up here, which is itself an equivalence relation, and it contains all of these guys, so it must contain their um, greatest or their least upper bound. Okay, so that's alphas contained in beta. So I remember I called this guy alpha. Call this guy alpha. And so now for the other direction to see that betas contain an alpha, note that if I have theta one through k, theta k in my collection theta, then the relative product of these guys is contained in the relative product of alpha with itself k many times because each of the um, theta i are subsets of uh, the join of all the thetas, uh, which by definition was alpha. And so all of these relative products are contained in alpha. And so, um, of course, the trivial equivalence relation is also contained in any equivalence relation in alpha. And as such, this entire right-hand side is a subset of alpha. And so that's the reverse containment and shows that these two sets are in fact equal. And so that's the proof. All right. Now, uh, we're going to move on to talking about complete sublattices. So if I have a complete lattice L and sub some <laughs> sub sublattice M of L, we say that M is a complete sublattice of L when for each subset X of M, we have that the join of X and the meet of X as computed in the lattice L are elements of M. So uh, if you look at the previous examples that we gave a little more carefully, you'll see it's possible for complete lattices to have sublattices which are incomplete and vice versa. Um, so you can see that just by checking through those examples um, more thoroughly and looking at which ones are sublattices of which other ones and which are complete and which are not. Now uh, consider this uh, lattice that we looked at before, the finite subsets of the naturals along with the one extra top element, which is the collection of all natural numbers um, under their usual ordering. This is a complete lattice, which is a sub lattice of the complete lattice of all subsets of the natural numbers. However, it is not a complete sub lattice. And so the reason for this is that this, this condition as computed in, in the original lattice L. So, uh, observe, for instance, that if I take, and this is the example I was trying to do at the beginning when I was a little tweaked out and got ahead of myself. So if I take my collection of subsets X to be the set consisting of, uh, the set consisting of, um, let's see if I do, Uh, one, three, five. I do the collection of all of the singletons, which are odd numbers. Then if I take, um, if I take the uh, soup or if I take the join of X in, in this first lattice, well, this is an infinite collection of natural numbers um, or an infinite collection of singletons whose union is an infinite collection of natural numbers. And so um, this collection has no upper bound in this, in this lattice or has no upper, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's not what I mean to say. This collection has no upper bound in the finite subsets of the naturals but it does have an upper bound in this whole lattice, and that upper bound is the natural numbers. Because no finite subset of the naturals contains each of these guys as a subset, 
but all, the set of all natural numbers does. However, if I compute the same join in the collection of all subsets of the natural numbers, I actually have that this join is the collection of all odd numbers. One, two, one, three, five, seven, and so forth. And so uh, this join exists in the collection of all subsets of n, but um, it itself is not a finite subset of the naturals, and it's not the set of all naturals. So, um, so what's happening is that although um, this the supremum of x exists in both of these lattices, and this this lattice is a sub lattice of this one. Um, when I take the join in this big lattice, the bigger lattice, I actually get um, a subset or I get an element which doesn't belong to this collection. And so that's how this complete lattice can be a sub lattice of this other complete lattice, but fail to be a complete sub lattice. Okay. So we actually have some standard examples of complete sub lattices available to us. If we have any algebra A, then the congruences of A are a complete sublattice of the lattice of all equivalence relations on A. Moreover, if B is a reductive A, then the lattice of congruences on A um, are uh, that lattice is a reduct of the complete sublattice. <laughs> wow, I am just tripping over myself. Well, let me start over. So if B is a reduct of A, then the congruence lattice of A is a complete sublattice of the congruence lattice of B. And so I think this is the first time that I've used the word reduct. So let me explain what that means. If A is some algebra, A with a collection of basic operations F, then we say that an algebra of B is a reduct of A when the universe of B is still the same as the universe of A and the collection of basic operations G of B is actually a subset of the collection of basic operations F of A. So for example, if A is an algebra with two basic operations, F1, F2, then uh, one reduct would be A, F1. Another possible reduct would be A with only the basic operation F2. And yet a third possible reduct would be A with no basic operations, which is like how we thought of a set A as being an algebra when we talked about the equivalence uh, relation lattice actually being a congruence lattice before. So uh, if B is a reduct of A, then the congruence lattice of A is a complete sublattice of the congruence lattice of B. And now notice that it, it may possibly seem to you that the ordering is reversed um, here, but the, the way to remember this is that if B has less operations than A, there are less constraints on when an equivalence relation can be a congruence. The more operations you stick in, the more constraints there are on an equivalence relation being a congruence. And so if you add in more operations, you should get less congruences typically or at least uh, you can only lose congruences by adding in more operations. You might not lose any, but in general you will. <laughs> okay. So we're going to finish today uh, by giving two classic results on the congruence lattices of groups and of lattices. So this first result is one of Dedekind's first results in lattice theory uh, in the year 1900. Um, which says that the congruence lattice of a group is modular. That is, the congruence lattice of a group satisfies the modular law that we talked about before. So note that if alpha and beta are group congruences and um, xy is in this relative product of alpha and beta, um, then there's some z by definition of the relative product so that x is related by alpha to z, which is related by beta to y. So we're now going to show that actually x is uh, related by um, 
related by beta composed uh, with alpha to I. And so first, uh, we're going to note that um, XZ inverse is related to um, XZ inverse by beta, just because beta is an equivalence relation. And so this is reflexivity. And then by assumption, Z is related by beta to Y. And so using the substitution property, we see that XZ inverse Z, which is just X, is related by beta to XZ inverse Z inverse Y. So that's that's this. Okay. Now, uh, now similarly, um, X is related by alpha to Z here. And then Z inverse is related to, or Z inverse Y is related by alpha to Z inverse Y because alpha is an equivalence relation and that's the reflexive property. So then using the substitution property of congruences, because alpha isn't just an equivalence relation, it's a congruence, then we have that X Z inverse Y is related by alpha to Z Z inverse Y, which is just Y. And so then that's this part. Okay, so if xy is in alpha relative product with beta, then xy is in B beta relative product with alpha. So this shows that alpha composed with beta is the same thing as beta composed with alpha. In this situation, we say that alpha and beta permute, that these two congruences permute, and we actually have that the join of alpha and beta in the lattice of congruences of our group in this case is actually the relative product of alpha with beta in either order because those congruences permute. Okay, and that can be seen uh, from some of our previous work in computing the join of two uh, or of a collection of congruences. Okay. All right, here we go. So now we're not quite done, uh, but we're on our way since we know that congruence is in a group permute. So we can compute joins by just taking relative products. Now let's suppose that alpha, beta, and gamma are congruences with gamma contained in alpha. We must show this non-trivial containment, alpha meet beta join gamma is contained in alpha meet beta join gamma. Um, in order to show that the modular law holds. Because remember, the reverse containment is always true and, and we need equality. So we need to show the non-trivial containment. So let's take some xy in the left-hand side. And I, uh, okay, and so if we have xy in the meat of these two, uh, in the meat of these two congruences, then uh, well, in particular, xy must be in beta join gamma, but we actually know that beta join gamma is beta relative product with gamma because the congruence is of a group permute. And so there must be some group element z so that x beta z gamma y. Okay, so we'll need that. And also notice that since gamma is a subset of alpha, then we have that um, we have that z alpha y uh, alpha x because um, because we have that uh, we have that z gamma y and so if z if z y is in gamma since gamma is a subset of alpha we must must have that z y is in alpha. So that's how we know that's z alpha y. And then since uh, since xy since xy is in alpha, that means that x or since xy is in the meat of alpha and some other congruence, that means in particular xy is in alpha or x alpha y, and by symmetry y alpha x. So that's this part. It comes from the xy is in alpha meet something else. Okay, so now when we combine these two together, we 
see that uh, we see that by uh, by transitivity we have that we have the z alpha we have the z alpha x. Okay, so we have that uh, we have the z alpha x, and we also have or well, and that's equivalent that's equivalent to having that that x alpha z, but we also have the x beta z. And so that means that X is related to Z by alpha meet beta, by the intersection of those two congruences. So then we have X alpha meet beta Z by combining these two together. And then we have the Z gamma Y uh, from this part. And so we have that, so now we have that X is uh, related by alpha meet beta relative product with gamma uh, to y. But remember that the composite of two congruences, in the case that we have permuting congruences, which we do for groups, the composite of two congruences is the join. So alpha meet beta composed with gamma is actually alpha meet beta join gamma. And thus we've shown that xy is in alpha meet beta join gamma. So the left-hand side is indeed a subset of the right-hand side. Okay, so um, okay, so that might have been a little fast, especially if this is your first time doing this. I encourage you to go through and make sure that you can actually follow every single one of the steps that I just did. Uh, but also, <laughs> note that this is a little more abstract and actually maybe cleaner in some sense than. Uh, the way that Dedekind originally did this in 1900. Um, and so it is also informative if you haven't already done it in an elementary group theory class to uh, go over Dedekind's proof that the congruence lattice of a group is modular by actually working with normal subgroups rather than congruence uh, congruences um, because that also might be informative to see how he originally realized that one could do this in a more concrete setting. Uh, but it really turns out that this argument turns on the fact that uh, congruences of groups permute is really what gives this to us. Okay. So uh, that's actually already a pretty, uh, pretty intense restriction on what the congruence lattice of groups can look like. Um, and so now let's see something similar for lattices. So to finish up today, we're going to look at uh, results of Funayama and Nakayama from almost half a century later on congruence lattices of lattices. That result, which we're going to state but not prove, is that the congruence lattice of any lattice is distributive. The, congruence, the congruences of a lattice don't generally commute, so this argument takes a little more work. The majority terms we discussed previously when looking at distributivity are very helpful here. Uh, recall that every distributive lattice is modular, so the congruence lattices of lattices are more constrained than the congruence lattices of groups. They're even more special in this sense. So thank you guys for joining me again today uh, for some universal algebra and lattice theory. I will have uh, new lectures coming to you very shortly. Stay tuned. <laughs>